Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Welcome to a very interesting episode coming up with Greg J. Matthews. Now, if you've been in social media, you might have seen Greg's book released last week, Wild Awakening, and it was about a grizzly attack that almost killed Greg in Alaska. He was bow hunting in Alaska. And so Greg's going to start off by giving some of his background, and then we're going to get into the story about how he survived a grizzly attack in Alaska. Greg, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bruce, for having me. And uh, it's really an honor to be here with you today. I know we're going to talk about the grizzly attack, but if it's all right with you, I'd like to share some of my background uh, through my careers and what the Lord has allowed me to do. I come from a family of people that have served in the military. My grandfather was a retired Air Force uh, master Sergeant. My dad was a Marine and then went on to do a career with California High Patrol and then with NCIS. My uncle was a Marine, served in Vietnam. My other uncle was in the Coast Guard and he served in Vietnam also. My other uncle was a paratrooper. My brother served in the Navy. I served in the Air Force and my other brother, my little brother who saved my life, he's retired from the Air Force up in Alaska. So the framework was set that it was going to be, at least for me, entering into careers of public service. I became a reserve firefighter in San Diego County at 17, and then I went on to do four years as a a firefighter in the United States Air Force. From there, I retired from my four-year enlistment and then went into being a firefighter up in Seattle, up in the Puget Sound area, and did a career for 21 years there. I was on an engine company, truck company, rescue, paramedic unit, BLS aid car. You know, in the fire service, usually about every five years, you rotate into different skill sets. And so I did a high angle rescue, hazardous materials tech, all different wildland fire. And during this time of my career in the fire service, my good friend was killed on uh, Rescue 5, the FDNY. And so I ended up going out to the World Trade Center and spent three and a half weeks working with his brother, who's also an FDNY guy and their crew, looking for Andre Fletcher. We never found him, but I can tell you that event really changed my life. It sent me into a change of a mindset of what I could give back. I've always tried to be a protector, making people safe, trying to be there for people when they're in their worst moments. My dad was already working in NCIS and was in force protection and anti-terrorism. And he began to talk to me about some opportunities I might want to think about. Just the kind of person I am, I was kind of feeling like all I was there was to respond. And I hadn't done anything on my part because I kind of feel like every American has a responsibility to do their part to whether it's see something, say something, or enter into a career to protect this nation. and. It kind of felt like I had let my nation down in a lot of ways. And so I came back. I started a terrorism response operations division within the fire service for suicide bombers and chemical and biological attacks, as well as securing the command post from secondary attacks from terrorists. And then I retooled and reschooled and went back and went to every course that President Bush was laying out there for the new DHS and Homeland Security became certified within anti-terrorism and counterterrorism, And so at that point, I was lucky enough to be hired as the Homeland Security or one of the Homeland Security managers for the city of San Diego. And then from there, I went to work for the Admiral for Navy Region Southwest, protecting the whole naval footprint in the Southwest portion of the United States. So a lot of my hunting was hunting around for different things to do to keep from terrorists from attacking the metropolitan city of San Diego and the parking lot of ships and carriers and subs and aircraft and stuff for our Navy on the the Southwest coast. It was just something I decided to do. 
Of course, in between all that, I used my GI Bill. I became a, a pilot, uh, both fixed wing and helicopter, and then started. I ended up going with a contract organization to fly uh, search and rescue in a helicopter up in the North Cascades. And then I also had a buddy that ran one of the biggest bail enforcement companies in Washington. So I became a fugitive recovery agent. Yeah, overachiever is right. And <laughs> after the attack, I kind of realized that some of the things that I was pursuing wasn't always for the right reasons. I think they did good things for people in their times that they were hurting or needed to be rescued or, or needed to be made safe. But I had a lot of brokenness growing up. And a lot of the stuff I was doing, I was just kind of proved myself to my dad and the world that kind of met the mark as a man. So not all healthy stuff, but I think the things that I did were helpful to people. So how long have you been a hunter? Well, I grew up hunting with my dad. He used to pick me up when I was in kindergarten, literally, and take me. We used to live up in an area called Big Bear, California. We used to drop down the backside of that and hunt dove and quail and pan for gold and all that stuff. And it kind of transitioned there once he got moved to San Diego. I mean, it's not the biggest hunting ground in the world, but there's dove and quail and there's hogs. And that's where I started hunting uh, Columbia blacktail deer with my dad. My grandmother and grandfather lived out in the Mojave Desert. So we shot a lot of varmints, coyotes, did a lot of rabbit hunting. And of course, it was always a dream with my brothers and I, as my dad escalated the types of guns that he gave us for Christmas to one day go and then do a real world big game hunt. Our choice was Alaska. We did have the opportunity to do that. And a lot of things went good, but yeah, some things went sideways on that. So it's all my life I've been hunting. I, I'm on a 3,100 acre lease here in Texas, hunting whitetail. And uh, I've only been on it for a couple of years. And hunting hogs is my favorite. I like to hunt hogs at night. That's one of my favorite things to do. So pretty much all my life, sir. I, definitely, I wouldn't call myself an expert, but I love just being outdoors and I love the challenge. It's not always about the kill for me. It's everything else. It's the preparation. It's the equipment. It's the choosing and selection of the spot. It's the scent control, all of those things. Because especially those boars that come in as singles, they are very, very smart very, very cunning. And a lot of times, not always in the best mood. Well, with that, let's transition to Alaska hunt with your brother, Matt, I believe. Is that correct? That is correct. So let's talk about how long it took you to get Alaska. Because I know after reading your book and talking with you, it just didn't happen overnight. And I, I want my listeners to understand the extent of preparation that it takes to one travel and then go into the Alaska backcountry. Basically, you get 20 miles out of Anchorage and you're in wilderness. That is correct. Let's talk about the first part I'd like to talk about is just the preparation for what you did. Right. Well, as your listeners, I'm sure, can tell just by what I shared with them, I'm a little bit of an overachiever, so I overprepare. My boss in San Diego was a Marine. He taught me the Marine Corps planning process and Frankly, Marines don't give options for fail. And that's kind of the way that I approached this hunt with my brother. The reason I could hunt without a guide up there is because my brother is a resident. He's been up there for 12 years. He's hunted caribou. He's hunted bear. He's hunted moose. So obviously felt comfortable in going with him. But recognizing that there's a lot of preparation when you're going to be so remote that, you know, obviously you can't just run to a store to go and get what you want. Originally, we had planned to spend a year planning once we came up with the idea. And I'm sure most of your folks understand how expensive it is. My brother being up there reduced the cost probably in half, but I still didn't have all the equipment and gear that I needed to prepare for the elements, to prepare for that type of hunt, to be able to get the game out as far as having a, setting up a spike camp and equipment tent and, and all that stuff. So we split up the duties based on our skill sets. I had the responsibility for obviously the medical piece. We were looking at how we were going to purify water if we needed to. You know, you look at the basic elements of what it takes just to survive out there. You got to protect yourself from the elements. You got to protect yourself because you are definitely on the food chain out there. So you've got potential predator issues. 
You've got to figure out your food, listing out all your food. And I will tell you that Alaska Fish and Game has a booklet that they can provide people that we used as a basis for preparing and going through all. It's a literal checklist that you can use on any hunt, any six, eight, 10 day hunt. It's a good baseline for being able to know that one, people know where you're going to be, that they've been given the same maps and the locations that they're going to be, including the GPS grid coordinates. So that if something goes wrong and your communications plan for communication to them at the end of the day, saying you made it back to camp and all that, if, if they don't get those notifications, they can start making other notifications to determine whether or not there's something that's gone wrong. And that was just one piece. So you have a communications plan, you have a food plan, obviously weapons of choice. I reloaded, even though I was bow hunting, I was going to be going, I had a bear tag, a black bear tag that I was going to try and do with a rifle. And so I reloaded all my own ammunition to obviously the maps and use of GPS, but we also learned about using a compass because we built redundancy into everything that we did. No matter what we were preparing for, electronics was good and electronics was primary, but we always had redundancy old school going back to using a a pencil and a piece of paper or printing out stuff that we laminated. Our maps were laminated, so if they got wet, that they wouldn't be destroyed. And so we just marched down every single one of those things that goes into preparation, including weight, including testing tents, sleeping bags, going into YouTube, I'm sure your listeners know, is a very, very cool tool for looking at anything and people out there are testing stuff so that you can know what the limits are of that equipment. So we spent the first year going over everything with that. We both decided to shoot 300 Win Mag. And I had loaded 200 grain Nosler partitions in those belted cartridges. And so the reason we did that is so that if there was an issue that came up that we needed ammunition, we wouldn't have to figure out where to get or whether somebody ran out of ammo. We were both shooting the same ammunition. To think about that, you can see the level of not only redundancy or that layered planning of just ensuring that there wasn't room for failure. But yet we had failure out there. We did make some mistakes. We canceled after the first year because I had a move to make. I became the anti-terrorism officer for the Southwest Division of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, is which I do now. And so I protect all the dams, the hydropower generation plants, and the intercoastal waterway locks from terrorist attacks. So I am very methodical because if I fail, the terrorists we need to be right 100% of the time. The terrorists need to be right once. And so my redundancy kind of moved into my planning aspect of for everything. My wife teased me as like, okay, well, if he's planning to have a shower out there, guarantee he's going to have a solar shower set up with something surrounding it for some privacy. He's going to be keeping the towel out of the dirt. He's going to figure out a way to hang the stuff in there. And if that doesn't work, then he's going to figure out how to have a washcloth and heat water and be able to do that and use bio wipes and and all the other stuff. I mean, everything we did had redundancy to it. And that's what I would recommend to all of your hunters and outdoorsmen going out into remote areas. When you flew up there from Texas, how many bags and gun cases did you have? Because there's limitations. I mean, you just don't drive to Alaska. Yes, you can. But for most of us, we're going to fly. So talk to me about weight limits and number of duffel bags or gun cases. So up in Alaska, having done the research and being part of, in the Puget Sound, it's really, really wet. So I had a lot of dry bags already. And it was a give and take as far as what equipment was going to be taken. I literally brought into my office, I brought a scale And so every time that I brought something that I wanted to add to my kit, I would weigh myself first and then I would hold it in my hand or I would hold a series of things in my hand and I would look at the weight and I would begin to write it down. I ordered a single case. It wasn't a Pelican case, but something of that nature, a single case that had all of the foam was complete in there. It wasn't cut out. 
It was two-sided. One side was for my archery. The other side was for the rifle. And then I also included my electronics in there. I love a K-bar knife. It's not great for skinning stuff, but it's a great tool. And it's been proven, obviously, through military members. So I have a real-world K-bar knife with that quality of steel that, that goes with me everywhere. And then I have a Cutco knife that I wouldn't go anywhere without that. That is something that, as far as skinning, I haven't found a better knife than that. I've never had to sharpen it. So what I did was that one case had all the stuff that I absolutely needed to get there. And I just cut out the foam to shape it, knowing that in the future, I was probably going to be doing future big game hunts requiring the same rifle and and bow and broadheads and and all of that stuff. So I had a place for all the arrows. I had a place for everything in there. And the stuff that as far as clothing and everything based on layers and based on elements, I shipped all that ahead of time in boxes. And I don't think you're supposed to do it, but I ended up, because I had enough time, book or bulk rate really cuts the cost down on shipping that stuff. And so I shipped it to my brother and had it available. When I got on the plane, all of my bags were under 50 pounds. Otherwise, you you spend a lot of money. And I had two dry bags, one a duffel. One was like a sea bag, you know, the big ones. That one had a lot of my stuff in it. And then I had a duffel bag that was a dry bag. And then I had my weapons case that held my bow and, and my rifle. So you didn't have to pay anything extra or the weapon case? Was that extra or not? No, I kept it under and what things, I just balanced the weight out. I knew what everything weighed before I went in there and shipping that stuff ahead of time up there. I know that your folks probably might not have that option because my brother lives up there, but I do think some of those guide services will hold boxes for you. But remember A lot of the boxes are exposed to the elements once they're in transit. So I would make sure that everything is in case. One of my favorite tools is one gallon Ziploc bags and then the construction, the heavy duty construction 50 gallon black bags. You can use those for so much. You can cut a hole and cut sleeves in and put it on over different gear. You can wear it. And those Ziplocs just help to keep everything. You can put a piece of tape on. You can put inventory lists in there that you can see through the bags. I'm a bit extreme when it comes to preparedness, sir. (laughs) So for most of us, we don't have a brother. But I know with if you go to FedEx, UPS, or whatever, and you plan, they can send it to a FedEx or UPS location. Yes, they can send it right there and just ship it right to that location and then they'll hold it. You might have to pay something for the storage, but it does save a lot. Cause I know when I used to fish leaving from Colorado, I used to ship out my rods and everything beforehand right to the docks. And that was cheaper than taking them on the airplane. Cause they wanted me to pay a lot of money. And so once or twice it gets easy, but my tip is just to echo and summarize what Greg just said figure out logistically, okay, get all your stuff packed and say, okay, what can I ship up? And then if it gets lost or something, I've still got everything I need when I travel, all my medicines and all my electronics and my glass and and my weapons and everything. I've got all that with me. So I'm going to reduce that. But the bulk type of thing, that's really smart. Now, with your brother up there, you didn't have to worry about getting a tent because he had the tent, correct? Actually, that tent was part of my responsibility, and I opted for, it was a Kelty expeditionary tent. And I want to tell your readers, I have so much to learn about hunting. I definitely wouldn't call myself an expert. I'm pursuing the passion that I love that my dad implanted into me, and I've never had a lot of money to be able to do these types of big hunts and all that. I mean, I can tell you with the equipment and the gear and all that stuff, it probably cost me ten dollars or $11,000. And I know if I was to go with a guide up there, you're talking sometimes eighteen dollars to $20,000. And so the tent was my responsibility and I ended up getting the tent. But what I would recommend is having something that has a big vestibule 
for pulling off all your wet stuff and being able to have it right there in front until you get dry and inside and changed. And then you can work on basically putting that stuff in and around your tent or inside your tent to have it get dry and everything. I like newspaper for shoving into boots. That's, I know, absorbs a lot of the moisture and stuff. We didn't have boot dryers. And I mean, we had to make choices on what we could bring out there. My brother did have a 26-foot Alumaweld jet boat, so we had to weight it all correctly. Plus, we brought, I think it was close to 90 gallons of fuel, extra fuel in containers. It is weight and balance. I'm not a boatsman. My brother is. I'm more of a pilot, and so we had to think about different things, and it was a trade-off in the things that we could take and what we couldn't take. And as much as we would like to have all of our stuff out there, we had to make decisions on what to bring. So checklist, 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 scale, 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 and figure it out. But it can be done. I guess the thing in this part, this segment, preparation is key, but you can actually do it. And I've been fortunate to go and hunt caribou up in Alaska and fly fish up in Alaska. And sometimes I had a guide and sometimes I didn't. That's just the way it worked out. I know I rafted a couple of times and it was just me and my buddy and they dropped you off and said goodbye. And 10 days later, they picked you up. So Exactly. <laughs> well, and I plan on going on some more of those trips, God willing, someday. And I've learned a lot. I think I know that there's a lot of guys out there that I poured over growing up, field and stream and outdoor life and sports of field. I mean, that was our go-to. My brother and I used to ravage the library, bring all the books home. And a lot of times we lived our hunts through those magazines. and. It's not always, well, it's not for me about the kill. It's just being out there in God's country, challenging your skills against Mother Nature, setting things up and having things come together as far as, I mean, I was in charge of the kitchen and I designed a tarp with a single point with where it had, it would shed the water away from the tent and then using a small sapling. I was cutting off the branches on that to make hooks for holding all the pots and pans. It was just really fun. I just love that stuff. (laughs) So you fly up to Alaska, you get everything, you load it in the boat, you go launch the boat, and you went down in the Kenai, I believe. Kenai Peninsula? It was the Kenai. We had fished there for kings, and they got some huge rainbows. I'm telling you right now, if you want to go fish for some giant rainbows, fish that Kenai. But yeah, it was the widest confluence, I think, of the Kenai. It's called Skelac Lake. And it's not really a lake. There's a current, but it just widens out there. And it's got a big reds run there. It's beautiful, beautiful country right there. So you launched the boat and then you had to find a place to camp because had you pre-used Google Earth or Maps and figure out, hey, this would be a good point or this is a good bay to pull the boat in or talk to me about how you selected your campsite. So we did a lot of Google Earth and I don't pay. I'm a cheapskate. Okay, I'll just tell you right now. I'm a cheapskate when it comes to this kind of stuff. But there's an app that I use called Scout Look. And what it is, is it just puts you where you're at based on as long as you have service, which after a while we didn't have service. And there's another thing I want to talk about. It'll put you where you're at. And then you can scan in, you can use the map. And we picked out a place called Caribou Island, which was about halfway down, I think it was 12 to 14 miles long with Skelac Lake. And we were at the extreme end from where we launched. So we looked at this, we looked at it, it had good access. It was far enough away that with a big lake like that, Lake River, sounds carry a long ways. We wanted to be far enough away to set up our spike camp. And we just looked at where the access was, where the areas that we were going to be hunting, and we picked that out. One of the things I will, in the things that we've learned is for animals, and I'm talking predators, that they use the shorelines of the river and or the lake. So make sure that your camps are far enough back away from those areas that it's not going to be a transit route right through your camp. So we knew that right off, not that we'd had any experience at that point of having something walk through the camp of being too close to the river's edge or the lake shore. But two years, that's a lot of time to plan and and read and, and learn from people's mistakes. So Caribou Island was the choice of ours. And we set up the main sleeping tent or sleeping cabin, I'd call it. 
My recommendation is get a tent tall enough that you're not slumped over that you can stand up in. I don't think it adds that much weight, but it certainly is nice to be able to get dressed with not bumping your head on the tent. And everybody knows as soon as you touch the tent, you're probably going to get a leak if it's raining. So set up a cabin tent, set up an equipment tent, and then we sent up the kitchen, which I loved. I had a folding table. I love hurricane lamps. You definitely need hurricane lamps because of the oil. It's not the white gas. You know, you have a fire issue or explosion issue in confined areas, especially in your tents and stuff. Those kerosene lamps, I think, are a mainstay for providing not a whole lot of light, but once your eyes adjust, it's plenty of light for lighting the areas down too. We dug a, a pit latrine that we cut out a seat on one of the logs. And then on the back end, we cut out a pit latrine that was far enough away that it didn't smell or anything like that. And then the opposite direction, we cleared out an area and put our makeshift bear alarm around it for storage of our food. We didn't want the food inside the camp. And these are all just things we read about and learned from. We'd never had issues with, to say, experience told us this. We were just smart enough that we didn't want to relive other people's nightmares or, or bad situations, sir. No, on your bear alarm, how did that come together? Well, that was just something. I do live in the security world, and I figured whether it's Al-Qaeda or a bear or a wolf, it's all about layers and something alerting you that there is danger. And so what we did was it wasn't anything that it was that we read about. So I started doing some duck hunting here in Texas, which, hey, to all you duck hunters, it seems like a lot of work for a lot of being wet and cold constantly. And anyway, if you're a duck hunter, I know you love it because I've got friends that do. It's just not my first love, but they had their decoy strung with this 400 pound fishing line. And so we came up with the idea that once we got to my brother Matt's house, that he had collected about 20 Coors beer cans that he just stuck in a bag that we had the room to be able to take it out there. And then I brought two of those tubes of BBs. And what we did is we took that 400 pound test. We went around the camp and then around the food area. And as we were stringing it, we would slide these cans through the tab and I'd dump about 10 or 12 BBs into those cans and basically make sure there was enough movement on it that we would get alerted if something came through, that it was high enough that something at night was bound to hit it. And we did have an alarm that first night. We don't know what it was. I can tell you that I woke up, my brother slapping the, my cot, which that's another thing. If you can bring cots, it makes all the difference in the world instead of sleeping on the ground. I heard the rattle the second time. He said, something's out there. And I think that the alarm making the noise that the thing ran off because we sat there for a half an hour with eyes as big as saucers. And I had the 12 gauge and he had his pistol and we weren't sure what it was, but it definitely worked. That's great. So now we obviously from just listening to you, you got a good camp set up. Now, how many days had you planned to be there? It was a 10 day scheduled hunt. And we had obviously a couple of different ice chests for the start out frozen, obviously didn't stay frozen. We did get some dry ice, which actually helped to keep stuff a little bit colder. We had ice in the mornings and this is at the right around, well, the, the attack happened on the 22nd. So it was transitioning into fall, but we had ice on the boat deck in the mornings. It was still cold. So that helped to keep things cool. I can't afford to get Yeti coolers or anything like that. Neither could my brother. So we just used the igloo, the white marine coolers to keep stuff cold. Plus we had dry bulk stuff that we brought in bins that my recommendation, if you're going to use the bins, one, make sure and use those 55 gallon trash bags inside the bins. And make sure it's the bins that have the things that rotate over and then have inventory lists in those bins so you're not constantly digging through there trying to figure out what's in those bins. So the inventory lists definitely help. So we're in there for 10 days. And then, so let's jump into the hunt. Mm -hmm. Now, the bear attack happened on what date? 
four days into a 10 day hunt, sir. Okay. So you had four days. And so were you just the first couple of days scouting and looking for sign or looking for animals or kind of run me through the first couple of days? Well, so the first couple of days were exactly that after, you know, obviously the boats unload is floating a lot higher now. One thing I want to share about the boat, just to make sure that people understand if you're going to do the DIY, the do it yourself hunts, make sure that we ran into an issue with weight and we changed it, but the nose was a little bit heavy and it dropped the nose down to where if there was a white caps came up on your way out there, it could have very easily swamped or torpedoed the front of that boat down. So make sure and look at your weight, even though that's your biggest storage area a lot of times, at least on some of those jet boats, don't stack because we had fuel and everything up there. Don't stack that fuel and all that stuff too much in the front because you can definitely run to problems. And my brother identified it right away, but that's something that stuck with me that I wouldn't have known having not been, you know, a real boat guy. So two days into it, we basically skirted the entire shorelines all the way around of where the areas that we were going to be hunting. And it's hard to explain the vastness of what you're looking at, it's a bit overwhelming when you're just anchored on the shoreline and you're sitting in those captain seats and you're looking for hours on end through binoculars. I was using Swarovskis and it has really good eye relief, meaning that it has big open lenses in the back so you can be comfortable sitting there. And that's important. If you're squinting to look through those small holes with not much eye relief, it definitely wears on you mentally and and all that. And I'm, like I said, I'm not an expert. These are just things that I've figured out planning two years and the limited hunting that I've done. The other thing is a shooting stick with that Y allows the binoculars to sit on that shooting stick. And that way you don't have to hold it up. You can just hold the shooting stick with the binoculars And you get it set to that right distance with, you know, uncoupling it and sliding it down. And it makes it really easy to be able to glass. And I was using that in the boat. So you're looking at huge, vast areas, huge valleys, looking for any kind of movement. And actually, it was kind of frustrating the first two days. I thought we would see more. But then I started thinking about the vastness of what we were looking at. And a lot of time with moose, they are so stealthy because they're so slow. And you've got to be staring at an area that to pick up a flicker of an ear or a flick of a tail or something like that to actually even I have you to look in that one area. And one of the things I learned as a pilot and I kept reading is when you're glassing and you're scanning, do it in 10 degree increments so your eyes have an opportunity to focus on those particular areas. Otherwise, you're scanning so quick that you're not able to pick up those subtle movements and stuff. So we spent the two days basically scanning and glassing the ridge lines and up the valleys. And we saw a lot of ospreys diving for fish. When we got bored, we'd cast a line, do some trolling and caught some fish for dinner just to break it up. But I was a little frustrated the first two days. I just, I thought I'm here in Alaska. I spent all this money there should be animals all over the place, but I wasn't seeing it at that point. And until we got to the shore area, which would be the north east end of Skelac Lake, where we ended up sliding the boat up on the shoreline there. And the first thing we saw was two big piles of bear scat on the shoreline, just saturated with egg row. I mean, it was a bright orange. And you knew right away that that was, and then you begin to look down the shoreline, you can see the salmon that had had their guts basically eaten out. They were after the row because obviously that's a lot of energy in the fat with that row. And so when I first saw that, it wasn't fear. In fact, I don't know why it didn't come to me right away that, hey, that could be a grizzly. I was thinking black bear because I have a tag for a black bear. So I got excited about it. Finally saw really some good sign, then ended up going and scouting up the same valley where where I was attacked at to get, we saw it and it just cut me off, Bruce, if I'm going on, if there's a question that your readers, you think you would want them or your listeners would want them to hear, 
before I go into scout what we did scouting that area. Yeah, just talk about, you know, you found an area that looked promising. Yeah, there was some bear evidence, but that's the first animal evidence you've seen. So, yeah. you know, let's go on and tell the story. So it was on that the second day. We got there a little bit later. We both got out of the boat, saw the bear scat, gave the thumbs up to each other. And it was a, basically a huge valley, and there was two mountain ridges on both sides. As you looked into it, you could see in the distance there was a, a beaver dam that they had blocked. A section of it had turned into a beaver pond. And looking at it, it had some of the grasses and stuff that you know I had envisioned through all my reading with some moose's head buried in and seeing that those big white panels of it pulling those soft roots and everything out from that. It looked perfect. And so we got really excited. I was going to be bow hunting. That was what I wanted to do. I wanted to level the playing field, use the skills of what I had, limited skills as a hunter, and then also the skills that I had refined reading and I read everything. And to a point where I had to get that moose into a point within, I want within 50 yards is what I was hoping for. But this day I obviously left my bow. We both had rifles. We had packs with water and some beef jerky and granola bars and stuff. And we were going to see what we would find further in. Immediately we started finding very well used game trails but I also noticed that we were walking and it felt like on a waterbed or a sponge. It was that muskeg moss and there was big frost heaves. Some of them, you know, just a foot deep, some of them a couple deep. Some of them you could definitely break a leg if you fell into it. I know that probably people are wondering what types of boots you're wearing. I chose the lacrosse knee-high rubber boots because so many times the boots that I was using, the Danner boots that I was using, I would sink down into something and the water would come in over the top and then I would be in wet boots for the rest of the day, which is terrible. And so I ended up using the lacrosse rubber boots and that was what I was in that day. And it it definitely helped. I don't think you have enough stability that you would for like a Danner boot that's a three-quarter boot on your ankle and stuff. But being wet and I don't like being cold. I'm a sissy when it comes to being cold. I don't like being wet or cold. And so I opted for those boots. And so we started walking up. We decided to, based on where the relevant wind was coming from, it was coming left to right. As you're looking up the valley, we opted to move along the tree line on the right side, right at the base of the ridge line, and just move slowly up and see what we could find. And, and we were glassing We'd probably walk about 20 or 30 yards and stop for maybe 15, 20, 30 minutes and just glass, just taking in everything and living in the moment. I want to just talk to hunters out there. Don't get so caught up of getting to your spot and getting your bow drawn back or getting something in your crosshairs. Just live every moment because there's smells, there's visuals, there's, there's so many things going on along the way and that excitement just... I was just enjoying it. And so we moved up probably about a half mile into this valley. And then I saw something that I had never, ever seen before, but I had seen pictures of it. It was something I was looking for, but about three or four feet up this pine tree, I think it was a Douglas fir or something like that. I saw the white meat, the two foot white meat completely stripped on the trunk of this tree. And I knew what it was exactly when I saw it. And it it was a fresh rub. It was almost reflective as I was. In fact, I thought it was a panel of a moose from the distance. But then I quickly realized it was the trunk of the tree. And I pointed out to my brother and we got really excited. And so we cut across the valley and ended up getting to that rub. And there was bloody felt at the bottom of the tree. They had done a number of different work, working times, I'm thinking, to get all of that bark off that tree. So the bark mixed with the felt. And we were really excited. We were high-fiving each other because we knew that there was a bull moose that had been there recently. And so we were really excited. So it was starting to get dark at that point. The sun was kind of going across the top of the ridgelines. It stays the same distance as it seems like. 
because you're, you're getting away from the long summers and it's getting shorter days. So we're just glassing at that point, knowing that we're going to probably move forward on that the next day. But then as my brother is glassing the ridgeline that would have been to the east, he saw movement up in one of, you could tell it was transitioning to color. It was a, a blueberry field. You could see it. And he caught movement and I saw his interest and I'm like, what are you seeing? And he saw, although it was cinnamon, it was a black bear that was feeding in that. It looked to be about probably maybe 350, 400 pounds from the distance. We were miles from it, but he ended up finding it. And so we both spent some time and I was excited. I was looking at him like, can we do this? And he looked at me and he said, no, there's no way. He says, first of all, even if we got there before it got dark and took the shot, we'd be cleaning that thing in the dark and taking it out in the dark. He says, that is definitely not something you want to do. And I can say I knew better, but I was really, really excited because I had a bear tag. I'd never been bear hunting before. I had a bear tag and I had a moose tag. And so that's one thing is don't get excited and don't get yourself into a situation that you end up killing something and then you end up having to do. I know sometimes it can't be helped because a lot of our kills are done at that. We buy that optic that gives us that extra five minutes at the, when the sun's going down to be able to see to take a shot. But those are dangerous times when you're in areas where you are on the food chain, like in Alaska with wolves. We had heard wolves the night before. So we just opted not to make that run, but we did opt to come back. And if that bear was still in that area, that we were going to go after that bear versus going up the valley any further because feeling like we might have disrupted it going directly out into the middle of that valley to look at that rub. We want to maybe give it a day to rest if, for instance, that moose had been spooked or something like that. So coming back the next day, we were excited, stepped off onto the shoreline. The two things of scat were still there, but there was an additional pile of scat, meaning that from the time that we left just before sunset to the time that we got back, there was a bear that had come down into that same area. Yes, I was excited. And being the bow hunter that I am, obviously we like to dress light. I knew I wasn't going to be staying the night out there, but I do have certain things, a 55-gallon, a 50-gallon trash bag that I could have. And one of those, they use them for going over a sleeping bag, but I use it kind of as a bag where I could use the 50-gallon trash bag over me to keep me dry and then getting into something if I ended up having to stay the night out there. So everything was very methodical in my pack. It was a redhead pack, and I think I got it from Outdoor World, I think is where I got it. So I had everything set up in it, and I was going to carry my bow and the bare minimum, my knife. I had a sidearm. I had a 357 Magnum, which looking back, I probably should have went with a 44 Magnum. That was something that I would do something different. And so as I grabbed my bow and started heading out, I saw that third pile of scat and I thought, man, I'm a bow hunter. We travel light. You know, I'm going to be back before it gets dark. I don't want to hump any more weight. I've got water on me. But, you know, I have to say it was probably the Lord that just said, hey, you may want to grab that rifle. And I, I turned back and I turned back to go. I say, don't need it. And then I saw that third pile and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to grab that rifle. And so I grabbed the rifle. My brother had his rifle because he wasn't bow hunting. He was going to be doing the calling. He had tags also, but he opted. He wanted his big brother to get first opportunity. And so we did the same thing that we did the day before. We got a, a little bit in and started glassing the ridge line. That bear was nowhere to be found. I was kind of disheartened because that was the first animal that we had really seen that we had tags for. And so I was kind of disheartened and he looked at me and he said, well, it's not there and it's no telling where it's going to be once we get up there. If we look at the prevailing wind and the upslope wind, our scent going up there is going to be blowing right into it. Do you want to go after it knowing that we saw it yesterday or do we want to go where we saw the rub and the potential that that bull moose is holding? Because we read, you know, a bull moose will hide and it was perfect terrain. It was the most inhospitable terrain there was as far as walking in. There was enough water 
enough of the elms or whatever it is they like to eat. There was a lot of saplings there that we knew that they like to chew on. There was water. We had the rub. And so I said, I want a moose. So we opted to take it in. So we got about three quarters of a mile in. And then we started angling in. We saw a knoll that was just kind of a rise in the middle of that valley. And we decided to walk at an angle there, which took us probably another half mile, except this time we're in the valley, away from the tree line edge. And we got there. And during that time, we saw fresh prints. We saw two main trails. And then right at the front or the confluence of this knoll at the front, there was two main trails that swept in front of me that would have given me a 25-yard broadside shot both to my left and in my front. And I just said, this is it. I just had a feeling that this is exactly the spot that we wanted. So for your viewers, and this is not from experience in moose hunting, because this is my first moose hunt with a bow. Moose tend to hang up in tree lines with even most the most effective moose calls, whether it's cow and estrus calls or, or wounded calf calls. They tend to hang up. And when they hang up, you either shoot it with a rifle or you end up having to move into an area to get a better shot. And so my brother having more of the experience, he was going to move 50 yards behind me at the back edge of the knoll and begin the series or patterns of calls. We set up the when it would start based on kind of synchronizing our watches and how long those calls would go for and then how long that they would stop and then when they would continue. We had that all mapped out. That gave me time to get into position to use some cover, some tree limbs, some different stuff to give me a little hide, as well as to spraying. Although the wind was light, it was still coming left to right, but it was circling in the valley. And so I ended up going up trail a little bit and spraying some of the bull. I think it, no, I'm not sure if it was bull. I think it was cow urine. I tracked down someplace up in Canada that actually had a resident herd of moose that they ended up, I don't know how they do it, but they ended up getting some stuff that was cow and estrus urine. And I went up trail and I sprayed it on some of the branches up there. And so not only did we have active trails, we had scat, we had a rub, but I was making sure that if there was a bull in the rut, that this thing was going to smell this stuff. So I felt that we had done everything. And for the first two hours, sitting there glassing, I saw nothing, literally nothing. And I was starting to get frustrated, a little bit over anxious. My brother, I had to turn around sometimes because those bull or those moose calls that he was doing sounded so real. And it seemed like everything was coming into place that all of our planning preparation was about ready to come to a point of I was going to look over. A bull moose was going to come into view. I was going to have to take that deep breath and relax. And my thought is from the movie, The Patriot, aim small, miss small. I'm going to aim it a hair on that moose instead of trying to hit a paper plate sized target right behind that shoulder and thinking I was going to have to slow my heart rate, all that stuff. And then on the third round, about in the third hour of calls, I'm sitting there and I catch some movement out of my periphery. And my heart, I feel my heart, instant dump of adrenaline, dopamine, my heart's racing. I can feel my respirations increase. And of course, this is a guy that's never shot a moose. So I'm excited about that. But I also think I'm not going to look at it in case I catch it in the eyes. I don't want that thing to know I am there. And so I hook up my release. I go to draw back and I swing over. And I know that all the blood drained out of my face. I could feel it like I was going to almost like pass out. One, my heart was racing because I thought I was going to be looking at a moose. And there over the tops of like these six foot little trees that were in front of me, was an eight and a half foot grizzly. And I saw at its feet two sub-adult, probably 300 pound, I don't know, yearlings or whatever. So total of three grizzlies. And this sow's head, the nose was elevated and it was swinging left to right, 
smelling the air. And immediately, I'd never seen anything like that, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out when something is hunting you. So I don't know if you want to transition into the hunt right now. Are there questions about moving into position or anything that you think that your viewers might want to talk about, Bruce? Well, I think, okay, it's not a moose, it's a grizzly. Now what do we do? Well, one is staying composed, and I can't say that I stayed. I was scared to death. I can't tell you. Here it is. How far away was she? At this point, she's about 35 to 40 yards at the confluence of these two trails. The one trail, as I told you, will sweep in front of me at about a 25-yard broadside shot. And the other one would give me, if I swung to the left, would give me a broadside shot. But that was probably maybe 30 yards to the left. But that trail swept right down to where my brother was. So there, were, there was going to be a decision point for the grizzly. And immediately what I thought, it was definitely not the right thought, was I wanted to run. That was what I wanted to do. I wanted to throw everything down. I wanted to grab my rifle. And I wanted to run. That is the first and foremost thing that you shouldn't do. I was a firefighter for 21 years. I have had to compose myself for a lot of different dangerous situations. But when I saw that thing's head swing and I knew it was hunting me, I knew that there wasn't a chance of even running. There was a big deadfall in front of me that had kind of a dugout area of it. I thought about hiding from it. That was my next thought. But then I started thinking, if this thing has got the olfactory, the ability to smell, and it's tracked me from upwind, it's tracked me to this point, and it's circling in on me, I would just die in a hiding spot. That thing would just yank me out of that. So on top of that, my thought was if it turned to the right and headed down that trail that paralleled the knoll that we were on, or the uprising, I guess, then it would find my brother and my brother wouldn't even have a chance of even seeing it before it was on top of him. And so what I did was I thought about the 357. That was just going to be something that was going to be upset. I actually had that for wolves, never thinking I was going to come face to face with a grizzly. That was a second mistake. The fact is I put the bow down being very slow and I was covered and camouflage. I had a net a camouflage net that I could see through. So there was no visibility to say that I was a human. So I slowly put it down and I grabbed my rifle and I got down on all fours and I began to almost like military crawl around to the right. And I was going to come up around the tree that was behind me. And once I came around the tree, I brought the rifle up and she was still standing there sweeping her head back and forth. And I had remembered because I wasn't going to use the rifle for the hunting. I had its Nikon and it was a four to 16. It was a top of the line scope. And what I had done to it is I had wound it all the way up to 16 because I was glassing using the scope on the ridge lines. And my hands were shaking so bad and my inability to think at this point, I didn't have the wherewithal to wind it back down to four power. All I had was hair in the scope. And so what I did is I stepped further to the left. I lowered it. I clicked off the safety, stood on my tiptoes, and I just said, whoa, bear. And at that point, the bear's head swung, immediately locked on me. It let out a a wolf or a growl, and both of those huge yearlings went crashing through the brush behind her. Thank God. And her eyes were locked on me, never took her eyes off me. And that's when it started to go into slow motion because she basically came around till she was in full view looking at me on all fours. And her head started just slowly dropping. I saw the ears fold back and her head started slowly dropping till her chin was probably eight inches, maybe 10 inches off the deck or off the ground. And then I could see that big black lip curl back almost over her nose. And then this huge muscle came out of the top of her head. And then all the hair stood up on her back and she started charging me. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I cannot believe this is happening for one. I can feel my finger on the trigger wanting to fire, but knowing it would do no good. 
And I'm hoping that this is going to be a, what they call a false charge, that it's going to come up. It's going to make her presence of dominance, display of dominance, slide to a stop, growl, woof, whatever it is that she's going to do. And then she's going to take off back to her cubs. And so at 25 yards, she's not slowing down. It's going into slow motion. I'm seeing that muskeg moss being thrown behind her as she's digging in to get closer to me. I can see the muscles flexing. I can see the hair. The ears are back. And this thing looks like a pickup truck. And basically, the thing weighed about 600 pounds. And so it's crashing through stuff. Now it gets to within about 15 yards. And I'm thinking it's got to stop right here. And it's still not stopping. It gets to 10 yards. And then it gets to about, I want to say about five yards. So about 10 to 15 feet. And I fire the 300 Winchester right in the bear's face. And it does nothing. I'm like, oh my goodness. I got to tell you what's I am scared to death. I am. This is going to happen. There is going to be a confrontation. And the only thing I have in my hands is that rifle. And so I just shove it out there as it's after I fire, it's lunging at me with its mouth open. And I shove the rifle out almost like a bayonet. And the rifle, I didn't have even time to rack another round. The rifle barrel goes into the mouth, hits something solid. It kicks the rifle back. It squares me in the head. And as soon as the rifle hits me in the head, the bear lowers its head and drives it right into my chest, knocking me down, knocks the wind out of me. My rifle goes flying. I'm sitting there trying to get my breath, wondering where this thing is. And all of a sudden, I feel two, I think they estimated between 10 and 12 inch paws while I'm on my back, come to rest right on my shoulders. And then the first bite is basically right to my face. My face explodes with blood. I don't realize it at the time, but it's ripped a hole in my throat. I don't even know if your listener or your viewers can even see it, but that hole was the size of a tennis ball in my throat. The teeth went through my cheek, through my gums, through my jaw. And when it bit down the first time, this is not a smile line. It basically bit all the way through and split my face right here. And I felt the rush of blood on my chest. And so at that point, it bit through a bit down and went to, I don't know if it was repositioning. I couldn't see at this point. My face exploded in blood, but my immediate thought was I needed to stop the bleeding at my neck. And so I was screaming. My brother said I was making noises that were inhuman. Let that settle in to you folks listening to this, because my brother, all he's hearing now is me screaming. It says it doesn't sound human. He's in lightweight waders coming through difficult terrain, trying to get to me. Him, he said it felt like slow motion for him. He said it felt like it took forever to get there. So I'm screaming. I twist my head to the left and put pressure on my neck, exposing the back of my head. And when I expose the back of my head, that is... I guess the choice spot for what grizzlies do to their victims. And then it took the whole back of my head to where its canines were right over my temple and began to bite down on my head. And it felt like a vice, like my head was being twisted in a vice and somebody was screwing it down. Obviously, I was letting out even more screams. And the only thing that I could do to think of was take my right arm and begin to, if you can picture this thing, having my head in its mouth, all I could do was punch the snout of this thing over and over. And then about the first fourth punch, it grabbed my arm. I don't know if your folks can see this, but right there, that's the bite radius on my arm. So the head's out here and here but those are the marks of where the teeth went through. And that's when it lifted me up in a violent head shake, stood up and basically going back and forth with my arm in its mouth. And then it threw me 
and I landed, I spun around on my butt, not knowing where I was or where this thing was, I couldn't see. And then I heard it moving around me and all I could do was scoot around on my butt, spinning around, trying to keep it in front of me. And if I thought if it came forward, at least I could kick it away or something like that. And then all of a sudden it went silent and I couldn't hear it moving anymore. And then all of a sudden I heard the growl again right behind my ear and I felt the breath as it came in and grabbed my head again and started biting down on my head again. And of course I'm screaming again and I'm thinking, where is my brother? Of course, he's trying to get through different stuff in waiters. So it bites me in the head. I'm screaming. And then all of a sudden it lets go of my head and I spin around. And the only thing I can think of is this point after biting my face and neck, after basically its fangs went right through my arm, about ripped my arm out of the socket, swinging me around on it and biting my head twice. All I can think is I've got to roll over on my stomach to get my vitals covered, you know, by the ground. And all I'm going to do is interlace my fingers on my C-spine spread my elbows, and then spread my legs so it doesn't roll me back over because I'm pretty much done. This thing is a monster. It's like a, I call it a land great white. This thing is more powerful than I could ever imagine. The size is unbelievable. and There's nothing at this point that really I can do except hope and pray that I can stay on my belly and it doesn't flip me back over because it's just going to go from my face or my throat again, or it's going to try and bite my stomach out or something like that. And so I'm on my stomach in that position that I'm describing to you. It comes up on my right side, reaches over. And this is just what I'm feeling. I can't see anything. It reaches over its paw across my rib cage and attempts to roll me over. It lifts me about halfway up and I battle back down to stay on my belly. And it's starting to get irritated. So it comes up over the top of me, sinks its teeth down through my scent lock jacket and sinks its teeth down into my lat and picks me up completely off the ground and then drops me trying to flip me back over. And I just roll back over onto my belly and interlace my fingers and spread my legs again. And then it just became really irritated. And it came up over the top of my head. And I can only describe it because I didn't see it. But I would imagine this thing over the top of me with one paw kind of straddling my back. It just came up and basically came down to the side of my head and sunk its main claw. And the surgeon did good, but it started right here at my top of my ear and basically came all the way down kind of, and I could hear it like fingernails on a chalkboard. It basically scraped all the way down with that one swipe. And it took my scalp and laid my scalp completely over off of my skull, exposing my skull and my spine. At that point, I spun back on my butt. That hurt a lot. I didn't know what was going on. I was going into shock. And at that point, it was moving around me again and I heard it to my left and my, the only strength I had left was in my legs because it hadn't bit my legs yet. And so it was coming around. I could hear it. I just started desperately kicking to the left and I hit it the first time and I scooted forward to try and kick it again. And about the third kick, it caught my leg in its mouth just below my knee and started biting down. And I started screaming again. But this time, in between my screams, I heard my brother yelling at the bear, and his voice would come in and out. Of course, you got to understand, I'm in shock, and this bear has got my leg in its mouth and biting down on my leg, and it really, really hurts. So it's biting down. My brother's running up, and I can feel my leg being twisted each time my brother runs up, and it's because the bear is turning with my leg in its mouth. And my brother describes it that the bear's head was completely covered in my blood and has my leg in its mouth as he's running up. He can't shoot it. The bear is in between him and I. And if he shoots it with at that trajectory and at that distance with those 200 grain nozzlers, 
in the 300 wind mag, that bullet, there's a potential it'll shatter bone, but it is potential it will go through that bear and into me. And so my brother decides that he is just going to run up and back and forth till that bear decides that he's a bigger threat than I was and drops my leg and comes after him. He's a brave dude. I don't know if I could have done that. So finally, after turning two or three times as he's running up, he ends up getting close enough that turns to a greater threat. He's got his rifle pointed right at it, and the bear drops my leg and starts turning towards him. He fires and hits it. Once I'm not in line with the shot, fires it, hits it in the chest. It stands up, leaning over, trying to bite him in the face, and he sinks another 200-grain nozzler right into its neck. At that point, it's got one in the face, one in the chest, and one in the neck, and it drops down to all fours, looking at him and doing that. It's a gruff. It's a roof. And looking at him, and it's looking back at me, looking at him, and that took some of the fight after the bear because it turned and ran into the adjacent tree line right there, which was probably another, it's just a small stand of trees, probably 35 or 40 yards away. He fired on the run and missed, he said, and he stayed there making sure it wasn't coming back. And at that point, I couldn't breathe with all the blood and mucus running down into my lungs, into my neck. And so I was just on all fours with my head in between my shoulders with a pool of blood basically leaving my body underneath me. And he finally made it over to me. He said that that bear is still alive. It's not dead. I don't know if it's coming back, but we need to get out of here. I don't know what else to say except for the fact the only words that I could get out was, I think I'm dying. How long did the whole attack take? My brother estimates that I was under the attack, specifically where it was just trying to rip me apart for about over two minutes. Oh, my goodness. And so with that, my brother kept apologizing. He felt like it took forever. And I can tell you on emergency scenes, when things go into high stress modes, it seems like it takes a while. To me, it seemed like two years that thing was attacking me. But I think a good, truthful, rough estimate is that thing had its way with me for about two minutes, maybe a little bit longer, but not much longer than that. And then how far away from the boat are you? Obviously, you made it out. So how far did you have to go back through that terrain to get to the boat? So it was rough getting out there, obviously. And we went a little bit longer ways because we went along the tree line. So we were out about a mile and a half back to the boat. And that's direct line as the crow flies. It was probably a little bit longer because of the fact that we had to skirt snags, those gray snags that fall and they get covered with moss and you've got to go over them or go around them and frost heaves and that muskeg moss and swampy areas. It just, that's where moose like to hide. And so going back to that boat was just unbelievably difficult. I gave up twice. I fell to the ground and gave up twice trying to make it back out. But the thing, and you've shared this with me before, because you had all the AMT training, you did some triage right on the site, and then you just knew you either get out or you're going to die. Yes, sir. I've seen hundreds, if not thousands of people who I've treated with the, I'm sure the same thousand yard stare that I had It's called hypovolemic shock. You have psychogenic shock, which is just from being scared, which sets in quickly. But hypovolemic shock is what kills you. And that's where you lose blood to a point where you're not perfusing the brain or the lungs anymore. And it was just simply a miracle that I was able to, because all I wanted to do was roll over and go to sleep. And I knew that that wasn't the right thing to do, of course. But I prayed right there, and the Lord basically, he said to me, he says, you're not done yet, Greg. I'm not done with you. I need you to fight. And I have to believe it was an absolute miracle that he allowed my brain to continue to perfuse, to draw on some of the things, the skills that I had learned as a firefighter. Because my brother, after I said, I think I'm dying, my brother said, no, you're not. Tell me what to do, Greg. Tell me what to do. And 
it was like he was yelling into a tin can or yelling at me underwater. I wasn't processing it. And then it, the Lord gave me clarity of the mind. I had treated lots and lots of patients. I just never had to treat myself. And this is what I was going to have to do. And so I took a deep breath. I'm still on all fours. And I told my brother, I said, get in front of me. I said, I'm going to raise up and I need you to describe the injuries to me of what you're seeing. And I paused and I said to him, I said, I first need you to tell me if my face is still there. I was having all kinds of things flash through my head, like having to return to my wife and my family as some type of monster with half a face. And not only was my body breaking, but my heart was breaking too, because I knew the injuries I sustained were significant and serious. And so my brother got in front of me. I just prayed and I raised up and I said, is my face still there? And he says, your face is still there. And then he said, oh my God. I said, what? He says, you have a huge hole in your throat and it's bleeding really bad. And I said, okay, well, that's probably the first place we should start. We were both wearing special forces shemogs. They're just head wraps that those guys wear out in the field. And I said, do you have your shemog? And he says, yeah. And I said, well, hand it to me. And so he laid it in my hands and I twisted it into a bandage. And I said, give me your hand. And I laid it in his hand. I said, now I'm going to lift my neck up and you put pressure on where the bleeding is coming from the most. And I'll tell you how much pressure. And I told him, I said, you can't put pressure on both sides or I'll just pass out because that's cutting the blood off to all the supply to the brain. And he said, it's on the left side. And I said, okay, put pressure on it. And I said, I grabbed his hand and I put the pressure with his hand on there. And I started telling him, hold that pressure. Don't let it loose. You can't let it loose. And I said, keep looking at my body. Where is there more injuries? And then he moved around to the back of my head. And that's when he said, the worst thing, just so you know, if you go up on an accident, the worst thing you can say to a patient is, oh my God, because that just brings out the worst. Well, my brother said that same thing again, as he looked at the back of my head, he said, oh my God. I'm like, what? And he said, your whole scalp is laid over. I can see your skull and I can see your spine. I said, is it still attached? And he said, yeah. I said, well, take your hand and flop it back over. Don't try and get the seams to match. Just flop it back over. And he did it. And he said, what do I do now? I said, well, is, that, is my shemog? I said, that thing, because I had the net on and then I had that shemog wrapped. I said, that thing, it tore it off of me somewhere. I said, do you see it? And he said, yeah, but I can't reach it. And I said, okay. So I took over pressure on my neck. He went and grabbed it. He took back over pressure. And then I spun that into a bandage and I laid it in my hand. And I said, put that where it's bleeding the most on the back of my head. And so he took my hand. And so I was holding pressure on my head. He was holding pressure on my neck. We can hear the grizzly still alive. We don't know if it's dying, but it's thrashing around. It's not happy in the woods there. And so we take about 10 minutes to get the bleeding stopped. And then I tell my brother how to tie a square knot and how to get those things into where they're still holding some pressure. And so we get those things secured, the bandages, the schmogs in place, and we start talking about a plan to get out of there. His thought is I'm going to lean on his shoulder, continuing to hold pressure on my neck and my head, and he's going to walk me out. And I told him, no, that thing is still alive. I said, what we need to do is strip all the ammunition out of my rifle. Because why? Because we were both shooting 300 Win Mag, which that piece definitely played off because now he had a pocket full of ammo as well as the stuff in his magazine, in his rifle. He was shooting a Ruger 7700, I think is what it was. And so he had the ammo and the idea was, or the plan was, I was going to cut across and stay on the game trail, which hopefully was going to be easier. I didn't realize there was going to be still a bunch of snags and frost heaves and everything trying to get out of there. But what he ended up doing is he was walking backwards behind me, looking back up trail with his rifle, basically guarding my six. And I'm holding pressure on my neck and I'm holding pressure on my head. 
And now at this point, the whole front of my body is completely, all my scent lock stuff is completely soaked in blood. Before I started walking, he took some water and was able to wipe my eyes. And once he got that pressure and the bleeding slowed down from my head, it was just basically running into my hair. I was able to see again, thank goodness. And it was a miracle from God that the bear didn't bite my eyes because that's what I was concerned with, that he was able to wipe my eyes from all the blood and the bleeding had stopped or had slowed down enough that it wasn't running into my eyes anymore and I could see for the walk out. So I just basically stumbled, walked, and crawled the mile and a half back to the boat. It was hell. It was literally hell trying to walk out. The Lord, I have to tell you, I can't tell this story without telling your viewers that had it not been for God stepping in at so many different points and performing miracles, including two points where one, I fell over a snag trying to get over it and fell to the ground just crying because I didn't think I was going to live and still trying to hold pressure on my neck and saying that to my, I'm having a vision of my family calling out to me that I need to fight knowing I didn't have anything left in me. And my brother stopped looking back up trail with his hand on my back, lifting his hand up to the Lord, praying over me. It was a very, very difficult time. (sighs) So we know because we're talking that you got here and and we're going to have to, I thought we could get it all in in two parts, but so you get back to the boat, fly down the passing fishing boat. They get in touch with air rescue, you get to the hospital and you're alive. And so that's where we're going to break this off at this point in time. And then what we'll have to do, Greg, we'll do another recording for the second half. So there will be a part two. Obviously you've heard Greg's story. What was the date of this attack? It was the 22nd of September, 2015. So it's four years ago and Greg came and Wild Awakening came to be because everybody kept asking for the story to be told, and you've just heard the first part of the story. So tell people how they can get your book, Greg. Well, I can tell you that it's available at all bookstores that are selling books right now. It came out about a week ago. We are seeing an incredible response on this. It's on Amazon. It's on Google. It's on Barnes & Noble. You can find it anywhere. And what I will tell you, and I'm sorry to leave you hanging, there's just so much stuff to unpack with this, but what's more exciting, I will tell you, is how God stepped in. We didn't even get to the exciting part. This is just laying out kind of the what we had to overcome, but it's absolutely unbelievable, and it's not me doing it, it's God doing it. So it's And it's about- produced by Simon Schuster, Wild Awakening. You can just Google it and it'll come up on Amazon. It's the number one new seller on Amazon right now. So Greg J. Matthews, author of Wild Awakening, survivor of a hellacious bear attack in Alaska. And this is part one. Greg and I will get together and do a part two at a later time, hopefully soon so I can put them both together. With that, Greg, thank you. Thank you for sharing this unbelievable adventure and testimony to your faith. I'm happy that you're my friend. Thank you very much, Bruce. It was a pleasure to be on. I look forward to part two and sorry to leave your listeners and your viewers kind of hanging on pins and needles there. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts 